All right, so uh, thank you for coming to the, um, thank you all for showing up at the Thursday seminar. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay due to the technical problems of the host. Uh, today, we are uh, extremely happy to have with us Maria Tomasevic from the University of Barcelona. And she will be telling us about uh, something which is a matter of science fiction, but uh, we'll see that not so much, perhaps, aspects of traversable wormholes. So please. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk. Um, yeah, it's not going to be exactly science fiction. I will be reviewing some recent progress that has been going on for the past couple of years, but maybe in the end we get to a more um, science fiction part. We'll see. So the outline for my talk is as follows. I will first introduce some basic physics of wormholes. How do we construct these traversable wormholes? What is necessary? Um, so what is the physics behind them basically? Then we'll see what we can do with these wormholes, what is something that we can apply them for. Um, and in the end, I'm going to mention some work in progress, but just mention just one slide work in progress uh, with Roberto. Okay, so to start, we are going to get everybody on the same page. Um, so in general relativity, all space times are allowed. This is something known. One simply has to solve the right-hand side of the Einstein's equations in order to determine what is the stress tensor necessary to produce such a spacetime. However, not all spacetimes are physical spacetimes. And the physics comes in when we impose certain energy conditions on our stress tensor. So after many years of work, we now know what energy conditions go with what sort of physics. And we know that in classical physics, what is required for classical matter is for them to, for matter to obey something called a null energy condition. This is just basically a statement about the positivity of energy, or in mathematical terms, it's just a doubly contracted stress tensor that has to be positive. Now, if we switch to quantum physics, we get something a little bit more elaborate which is to say self-consistent, achronal, average null energy condition. And even though this is a mouthful, what it basically means is that averaged energy has to be positive along a special kind of a null geodesic. And this is the achronal null geodesic, which I will discuss in a moment. And mathematically, the uh, equation looks just very simple. It's just we do an integrated version of the null energy condition along this special achronal null geodesic. So why do we have so many letters for quantum physics? This is something that Graham and Olam have taught us in 2007. And I'm going to go through all the letters now. So let me start with average. So we need the average part because it is known that quantum fluctuations can lead to local negative energies. And so if we want it for some quantity to be positive, we have to integrate over all of those local negative energies. And so we get to the average. Then the achronal, uh, achronality is just here meant to represent uh, what geodesic is the fastest. And by that, I mean that there are not gonna be any points along this null geodesic that can be connected by a shorter time-like path. And so, here we have a representation of what is not a chronal. So for example, this null geodesic that wraps around the cylinder is not a chronal because there are faster ways to get from one point to the other. So by, for example, going along this time-like path here. Um, okay. And the, in the end, we have the self-consistent part, which is a little bit redundant. It's just here to say that we have space-times which solve Einstein's equations. Okay, so that's for quantum physics. Now, what can we do with all these energy conditions? We can use them in something called the wright chaudhuri equation, which I've put here for a reminder. So the theta here stands for an expansion scalar. It's basically the rate of change of the area, the cross-sectional area that neighboring geodesics are going to trace out. Sigma is the shear. It's here, but it doesn't really matter. It just tells us how this area changes uh, in certain directions. 
And we see here on uh, the right hand side, the TKK that we saw also in the null energy condition. So this is basically the null energy um, condition object. And we see that if null energy condition holds, this is gonna be positive. So it's gonna have a negative sign overall. This is a square, this is a square. All of these three things have a negative sign in front, which means that the derivative of this theta along some alpha frame parameter is going to be completely negative. Or in other words, if the null energy condition holds, we have focusing of light rays. Our derivative is going to be negative, so the areas are going to be shrinking as we move forward. And now neck holds for classical matter, so this means classical matter is going to focus light rays. Of course, what else this means is that if we had negative energy, so quantum physics, we would have defocusing of light rays. Because in that case, this can become completely positive and it can overturn the effect of these two terms. Okay, so why is this even important? Well, we can use these energy conditions and the right degree equation in order to classify what is the set of all allowed wormholes. And the way we do that is by looking at the geometry of a wormhole. So here is an expertly drawn wormhole. And we imagine that this is going to be a traversable wormhole. So we want to pass from this sheet to this sheet. And we're going to go through the wormhole. And we see that as we're going through the wormhole, the area here is larger than the area in the middle of the throat, which means that our expansion is negative. But in order for us to get out to the other side, we have to start increasing in the area. And so the derivative has to become positive at some point. And the derivative becoming a positive indicates that classical physics cannot allow for traversable wormholes because that goes around uh, against the null energy condition. And we all know now that quantum physics can allow for them. But of course, there is a small caveat here. This wormhole has to be also long. So by long, I mean that it takes longer to go through the wormhole than it, go, uh, than, than it does to go in the ambient space between the mounts. So why is this a condition? So let's draw another wormhole space time. Here I've drawn two null geodesics, basically. The blue one goes through the wormhole. The green one goes outside in the ambient space. And in a traversable wormhole, the average null energy condition is going to be violated along this blue geodesic. But what we care about is if this blue geodesic is achronal as well because then we can actually apply our uh, self-consistent achronal average null energy condition or SCANIC for short. And now we can see that, okay, so achronal means that it's a shorter time length path. And now we can see that if we have a short wormhole, then that would mean that it would take a shorter amount of time to go through the wormhole than outside. Or in other worm words, the short wormhole would have a chronal blue geodesics, the fastest ones. Then we also see though, that for long wormholes, it's going to take a short amount of time to go along the green geodesic than it would to go through the wormhole itself. In other words, long wormholes have chronal null geodesics traversing through, and therefore we cannot apply our uh, SCANIC argument here. Or in other words, SCANIC is not violated along the blue geodesic. Okay, so let me just summarize quickly what we have done. We've shown that classical physics can allow for non-traversable wormholes because there's nothing preventing them, but uh, not for traversable ones. And quantum physics is necessary if we're going to have traversable wormholes with a, an additional constraint of them being long. So are there any questions up until this point? Go ahead. Yes, so simple question. So what's the use of a uh, long wormhole? I mean, if you can go faster through the normal path, then it becomes useless, doesn't it? It becomes useless for some things. It doesn't work out in all of those movies, I guess you love watching, or in science fiction novels, but they can become useful for some other things. And I'm going to talk about those other things in a moment. So, uh, of course, I asked the question in a very provocative way, I mean, uh, in some sense, but the, the real question, I think, is then how do you define, so what would be the definition of a wormhole in that situation? 
in the sense that I can imagine several space times where you would have uh, different null geodesics that can reach, that can connect to events. That's basically what lensing is about. Uh, so I, I was wondering then, how would you qualify uh, a wormhole in that? Or is it basically the well, a region of space time where you would have this uh, knowledge or energy condition that's violated? Or is there something else? Well. So I would, so a wormhole, just a general wormhole, I would define just as non-trivial topology of space-time. It's a handle in space-time, if you will. And then you have to uh, actually make a distinction between whether or not you're talking about traversable or non-traversable wormholes. So non-traversable wormholes are just going to be topological wormholes, if you will. And then traversable ones are in need of quantum physics as well. So you're going to need some quantum effects in it. It's not, not a purely GR statement, um, if I can say it like that. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Of course. So, uh, is there an issue of stability for the long traversable ones? Like if I do so perturbations, I mean, are there, are there results about their stability? Great question. I'm going to go to examples right now and we can see <laughs> if there are going to be stability issues. But just in short, uh, one needs to take care of the stability of wormholes, of, of course. For example, they can you can imagine just uh, two black holes that are connected by a common throat. Well, they can crash into each other, right? Or they can orbit around each other and also crash into each other. Or if I send in too much energy through the wormhole, they can, again, collapse. So. After all of these examples, I think what we have learned actually is that these wormholes are very fragile, as I guess you have not predicted. But um, nevertheless, even though they're fragile, they can be made useful and they can be useful for answering certain questions about, um, well, I'm going to get to that. So, <laughs> but they can be useful even though they're fragile and they can be stable enough, so to say. Is that okay? Okay, so let me then oh, sure. jump quick. Okay. okay. Let me then go to these examples. Um, so I'm, as I said in the beginning, I'm going to be reviewing some recent progress. And I'm going to start with 2016, where we had Gao, Jeffers, and Wall constructing short-lived wormholes in ADS-CFD. And a couple of years later, we had Malasena and Chi constructing long web wormholes in ADS-CFT in a slightly different setup. Uh, then we had Fu, Grado, White, and Merrill taking, a, taking us out of ADS-CFT and constructing perturbatively traversable wormholes by the use of cosmic strings. Malasena, Mileking, and Popov then um, upgraded this to a non-perturbative wormhole with magnetic fields. Um, his uh, Maldesen and Mileking then upgraded that even more by producing humanly traversable wormholes with the use of Randall syndrome brains, etc. So there have been many examples and I haven't listed all of them, but these are so to say um, important different categories of wormholes one can have. So let me go then into a little bit de more detail on some of these wormholes. So for example, uh, let's discuss traversable wormholes in ads -CFT. And by that, I mean, let's start with Gar Jeffers and Wall. So here uh, we have a picture of an eternal ADS black hole. And these are just the left and the right wedges. These are the two CFTs. And so what Gar Jeffers and Wall did is that they turned on an interaction that would couple the two CFTs. So previously they were uncoupled. And this interaction would produce a shock in the bulk in um, that shock would actually have negative average null energy and therefore can back react on the geometry making this throat uh, traversable. So in other words, the shock that you would induce would allow for these horizons to be shifted. And so one could send a signal from the right side to the left side, which would of course be impossible if these CFTs were not coupled. Another way of seeing the same picture is perhaps better explained here. So these dashed lines that are barely visible are supposed to be horizons. Um, this, these blue lines represent the negative energy shock. Now we have the back reacted horizons uh, here in these little corners. 
And then after we have a back reacted horizon, we can try to throw in some signal from the left hand side, if he, left side, if it uh, starts early enough. For example, some cat can travel through safely and get to the other side. So this is the basic idea, but of course there are some caveats that one can discuss. So for instance, the interaction that they discussed was turned on only for a limited time. And the, the way that they uh, put the interaction is, is by inserting, um, well, deforming the CFTs with the double trace operators. So these are two sim simple operators that they insert on both sides and H is the coupling. And of course, and if interaction is turned on for a limited time, then the amount of information can, one can send can be only limited as well. And uh, one can see that the amount of information is proportional to the ratio between the horizon area, uh, sorry, horizon radius and the radius of the ADS spacetime. B here is the boundary CFT. After some time, Aldasen and his collaborators improved on these points by coupling the CFTs eternally thus making the wormhole eternally traversable. Now, let's get out of the traversable wormholes in ADS CFT and go into the real world, where Maldacena, Malekin, and Popov managed to construct such solutions. So this is something that I already discussed in Iberian Strings, if you were there. So I'm just going to give a short review. What they basically did were to take two magnetic risenards for black holes in four-dimensional asymptotically flat spacetime that is connected by a common throat. And this common throat is described by a global ADS2 crisis two geometry. The global ADS2 part is necessary because it allows for natural traversability between the two sides. The traversability is then uh, achieved by using the fermions that move on magnetic field lines that are provided by the magnetic black holes, of course. And these fermions, since they're moving in ADS2, they can provide negative Casimir energy. Now, what they used was standard model physics. And this, in turn, restricted the sizes of these wormholes. So they ended up being very small at the size of electroweak scale. Um, but nevertheless, the wormhole managed to be a long-lived solution. So it lasts d to the cube time, where d is the distance in ambient space time between the mouse but we don't care about this number. What we care about is that the transit time is shorter than that. So we can go through the wormhole in and out many times before the wormhole collapses. Sorry. Uh, An upgrade. Say, oh, yes. When you say small, you mean the mouth or the length? So the size of the overall system is of the electroweak scale. So I mean also the, the mouse that you can go in. So the Reisenostrom um, black holes. Basically, exactly. sorry. The Reisenostrom black holes you start with, they have to be small? Uh, yeah. So, so the reason for this is because you don't want to excite the fermions inside the throat. Because if you do, then you can give the mass. And if they have mass, they can collapse the wormhole faster. Since mm -hmm. you don't want to have any positive energy in the throat that can overturn the negative energy necessary to keep the wormhole open. This is basically the reasoning behind their model. But one can upgrade it, actually, by not using fermions, but by using some mass of CFT that would come from a five-dimensional bulk. So this is a setting with a Randall's dungeon brain, where one will have a four-dimensional brain with this wormhole. But then the traversability would be achieved by using this CFT sector coming from the bulk itself. And then they managed to look at the actual numbers that the Randall's dungeon provides. Uh, that actually agree with current observations. And so within those observations, they made it few more traversable. Okay, so we have all of these examples, but can we actually create traversable wormholes? It turns out that we can, but let me just make one note first. So all of the examples that I have discussed so far had the wormhole topology. So they exist on all complete space-like surfaces at all times. And now the point was here just to uh, make them traversable by inducing some quantum fields in the bulk or just by quantum back reaction. But the question remains if we can have some creation of wormholes that didn't require a previous wormhole topology so that we can actually have a topology changing solution. 
And this is something that has been done recently by Horowitz, Merrill, Santos, and Wang, where they argued for these topology changing space times that can result in traversable wormholes. And the way they did it was basically to use quantum tunneling. And so in essence, they construct space times in which there exist instantons that can give finite probability for a cosmic string to break and produce two particles on its end. Now, this doesn't sound really like a wormhole so far, but one can realize that uh, one can replace these particles with small black holes. And if they can replace it with small black holes, if they identify their horizons, then they make a wormhole. In essence, they make a uh, Einstein-Rosen bridge. And now all that's necessary is just to use, use the usual physics behind the traversability to make such a wormhole traversable. So this was one example of how one can actually make a wormhole. But okay, we can make these wormholes and we have the solutions, but why would we even care about them? Which was, I guess, a question in the beginning. <laughs> and so I'm gonna argue a couple of different directions one can take in order to utilize these wormholes. And one of the nicer ones, I would say, is the relation of wormholes with quantum teleportation. And so before I get into the actual connection between them, let me just review um, what quantum teleportation is about. So all that you need to know is this picture over here, where we have some systems, L and R, that share a bunch of Bell pairs. Um, that's called these systems, Leonardo and Raphael, that share specific bell state. And so at some point, Leonardo decides to add a third unknown state to his box. And he performs a measurement on the combined system. He gets some result out. He calls Raphael, tells him what he's got. This is the calling process, the classical channel. And once Raphael hangs up, he can now have the state of the third qubit by performing some unitaries or not even that, just extracting the actual state. So that was a very brief recap of quantum teleportation. And so now to see what is the connection with wormholes, we have to look at their holographic dual. So for that, let's go back to the setting that I was in before with the gauge jefferson wall. So this eternal black hole in ADS spacetime turns out to be dual to something called the thermal field double state on the CFT side. So this is the formula for such a state. It's a pure entangled state. And in essence, on the CFT, it's again, just a bunch of bell pairs entangled. So now, if we wanted to send signals in this setting, which is what we would need for quantum teleportation, we see that if we just send the signal from the right side to the left without much thinking, it's going to just uh, scramble on the other side. It's just going to fall in the black hole, end up in the singularity, and not affect the left side. In other words, it's going to scramble the information within the same system. So we just send in some system and it remains in the same system. But Gao Jeffers and Wall figured out how to actually get to the other side by moving the horizon so that the signal can pass, just as we discussed before. And the nice thing about this is that this is exactly dual to the protocol of quantum teleportation. So where we now have the classical channel, the, the calling of Leonardo to Raphael, it's just the coupling on the left and right sides, and then sending the state, uh, teleporting the state in the bulk would have a dual of just traversing through the wormhole. So this setup here that I described is a bipartite setup. It uses only two sides. And one can wonder if one can actually make this a more general setting. And this leads me to something called multi-holes or multi-mouth traversable wormholes. It's just simpler to say. And we know some of the examples that are easily generalizable. For example, uh, this set of people <laughs> constructed a multi-mouth traversable construction by inserting a small black hole in the throat of the original um, standard model made wormhole. There was another paper in the same month that made a multi-boundary version of gauge Jeffers and wall exactly. Now one can wonder why would this even be useful? But this is useful because now we can study the multipartite nature of entanglement structure from the dual theory, which can sometimes prove to be much easier than the CFT part. And some previous work has already paved a way 
uh, how we can start determining this entanglement structure. And they basically told us that we should look at the positions of extremal surfaces that are associated with these wormholes. And the positions of these surfaces would then tell us something about the entanglement structure. However, their wormholes were not traversable. And so it would be very interesting to see how this would generalize to the traversable setting, and how we can make a multipartite quantum teleportation protocol in this setting. And now let me just switch up a little bit and um, tell you about another thing that can be useful, can be, yeah, that wormholes can be used for, which is time machines. So you might wonder why would I even talk about time machines in a wormhole setting? But in essence, it's not hard to see that if traveling to far away places is simple with wormholes, then maybe traveling to far away times is also simple. And time, time machines have not strayed away from scientists. Uh, people have been discussing them since the early days of general relativity, actually. You had uh, examples from Van Stockholm from 1937, where he managed to make a space time of a huge, well, infinitely long cylinder that is rotating very fast. And therefore, by rotating, he would, the cylinder would be dragging the space time around it and dragging it so much that it eventually it would tip the light cones over, making something called a closed time like curve, and therefore creating a time machine. There was, of course, the Gödel universe, uh, the rotating disk universe. We have the Kerr black hole, which is also rotating. You can see a pattern here. We have the God time machine, which is spinning cosmic strings, or in other words, rotating cosmic string, and so on. You see that there was always this component of rotation necessary in order for this dragging effect to take place and to make closed time like curves. And now, just to be clear but what, about when I say time machines, what do I actually mean? I'm going to introduce some mathematical definitions. So definition is very simple, actually. So if my space-time contains a closed time-like curve, then that space-time contains a time machine. It's as simple as that. And that curve that is closed is going to traverse the time machine. Now. Take note that the whole space-time doesn't need to be an actual time machine. It can happen that they have just regions that are chronology violating and that contain the time machine. Or in other words, space-times that contain time machines are going to behave reasonably well up until a certain point. And that point is something that we call the chronology horizon. So for all of, the, for, for all of you who like math better than words, <laughs> This is what I mean by the chronology horizon. So I0 of M is just a chronology violating region. And since we're talking about a future horizon, we're gonna take the future domain of dependence of this region and take the boundary of it. That's what I mean by a chronology horizon. And a keen eye can recognize that this is very similar to the definition of a Cauchy horizon. And uh, that's not a coincidence. Many chronology horizons are actually identified with Cauchy horizons. And so let's see how this would work out in a familiar example of a curved black hole. So I want you to focus on this region here where we have the inner horizons of a curved black hole. And in the usual setting, this will be identified as a Cauchy horizon. But now we know that these are also chronology horizons. So how do we know that? Well, we have to look at the Kerr metric. So here I've written the Kerr metric in Borel-Lindquist coordinates. And in order to determine what is the chronology region, we have to find closed time like curves. And the way to do that is to find what is the coordinate in my system that's periodically identified, aka it can create a closed integral curve, and then see if it can become timelike or null. So the way we solve for CTCs or closed time like curves is by literally taking the metric components in front of the d phi, because we know that phi goes from zero to pi, and solving for when this metric component actually becomes zero or negative, creating a null or time-like closed curve. Solving for this equation gives us some region in the space-time, and that region is exactly described by this gray colors that I've indicated here. Okay, so back to wormholes. It turns out that given a traversable wormhole, it looks extremely easy. 
to make a time machine out of this wormhole. And in fact, it seems so easy that people have seen that it might be a generic fate of all traversable wormholes. Now, an easy way to see that is by following a particularly simple recipe. First, we should acquire a traversable wormhole. Second, we induce a time shift between the wormhole mouths. And three, we just bring the wormhole mouths close together. And that's it. So let me discuss these steps in a little bit more detail. Um, step one, acquire a traversable wormhole. It's pretty much done. It's this entire talk. Step two, induce a time sh shift between the wormhole mounts. Now, there are various ways one can do this time shifting, but the simplest two are the following. So first, we can send one of these mounts on a twin paradox-like trip so that one of the mounts will experience some Lorentz contraction. And when it comes back to its original position, it would have its clock running at a slower rate than the other mouth. Or we can just do a gravitational version of this, which is to say we put a massive object next to one of the mouths, which would then produce the same effect. It doesn't really matter how we do this. The point is that we rely on some relativistic time dilation, dilatation, um, so that going through the wormhole then connects you to different times. And what I mean by that is that, for example, in this gravitational setting, if we put a massive object, it would slow time near one of the mounts so that the time difference between the ends of the wormhole would gradually accumulate as you let the, um, the this system evolve. Okay, and now we have the step three, which is to say we have to bring the mounts close together. And how close do we have to bring them? Well. Until the time it takes you to uh, until it takes you to go from one of the mouths back to the same mouth is shorter than the time shift that I have induced. And so it, um, at least for me, it's always easier to have a little story behind it. So suppose that the time shift was, for example, five years, the difference was five years between the mouths. If we have an astronaut passing through the wormhole in one of the directions, he would jump five years into the future. But another astronaut can jump in the opposite direction and he will jump five years into the past. And if that astronaut returns to his starting point at high enough speed across ambient space, so he just walks over to the other mouth, then the second astronaut can get back home before he even left. In other words, a closed loop in space because becomes a loop in time just as easy. And our astronaut gets confused as I'm sure all of you are right now. Now, this as has been indicated in the beginning is science or maybe science fiction. What I'm sure is that many of you will say preposterous because how can we have solutions that allow for time machines? For sure, I know that Hawking said that this was very unphysical as have many others. And of course, there was a certain debate going on in the 90s when people were discovering these effects. And after some time, the scientific community finally settled down for a specific conjecture, which is now known as the Hawking's chronological prote protection conjecture. It basically asserts that traversable wormholes should be allowed. They seem fine enough, but time machines don't sound very good. And the reason why we're never gonna have time machines is because physics of quantum gravity will kick in and prevent us, prevent them from ever forming. So in essence, why is this, con why did Hawking make such a conjecture? Well, several calculations have been done in these wormhole space times, and they seem to indicate always a divergence of a quantum stress tensor at the boundary of this chronology violating region as a that I was mentioning earlier. And so if one has a divergence of a stress tensor, that naturally leads to a conclusion that some quantum gravity effects are going to kick in before one can actually cross to the chronology violating side of our space time. Okay, so what is the story today? Well, it's been 30 years after the chronology protection conjecture and the status of time machines hasn't changed that much from it, but that's about to change, hopefully one day. 
with uh, some work in progress that I have been doing with Roberto. It's really work in progress, but okay. Uh, we basically tackled the problem of time machines for two complementary views. And one of the views uh, has led us to a conclusion that the chronology protection conjecture will hold, but will not require quantum gravity. So what was this um, project about? The goal of this was to show that one cannot make a time machine out of a traversable wormhole, fine, but one cannot make a time machine out of an exact uh, parametrically controllable solution of a traversable wormhole. So for example, by using the standard model wormhole that I was mentioning earlier. And our preliminary results uh, indicate that actually we're going to have some wormhole back reaction in such a way that the time never becomes bigger than the distance between the mouths, therefore never allowing for a closed time like her to form. The wormhole length will basically get longer so as to never allow for the little astronaut to go back before he even started. So that's one view that we had. That was a view that if we start with a reasonable space time, can we make a time machine? And we showed that one cannot do that. A complementary view to that is to say, okay, let me start with a time machine. What would that imply for holography, for example? So what we did is to put a time machine spacetime on the boundary in ADS CFD, and we simply saw what happens in the bulk. And here the preliminary results would indicate that the bulk is going to be regular up until a certain point, until the chronologic horizon, when it forms a whole of a certain sense. Uh, or in other words, the bulk becomes geodesically incomplete. So we have the nice part of the space time, which is described basically by global ADS. And then at some point, this global ADS develops a hole and one can just simply fall through. On the boundary side, this corresponds to us being in the chronology violating region. Okay, so that's our work in progress. So let me just summarize then in the end what we have done. What we've seen is that traversable wormholes are very much alive and well. It's very easy to construct them. One simply needs to make them long enough and add negative energy in order to support them. We've also seen that there are various examples of how one can do these constructions, ranging from those embedded in ADS-CFD to others that are realizable in labs, sort of. We have also seen that studying exact constructions is useful for studying entanglement structures, holographic dictionary, but also for resolving some old conjectures about time machines. Nevertheless, there remain many questions to be answered. And I would say that with these exact solutions, now it's a very exciting time to be working on wormholes. So thank you. Okay, Marija, thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. So, um, are there questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. So I have a practical engineering question. So imagine uh, that I give you all the technology and everything that you need to build a wormhole, a traversable wormhole. How much energy would you need? To do that, can you? Is there any way to calculate that? Because usually all of these weird space times in general, relative to also LQBR, warp drives, or whatever, they need crazy amounts of energy. So, is there any way to estimate that? Um, well, I can only give you an example that I know best, which is the standard model wormhole. That's what I meant by building in the lab, because there it doesn't seem that you require anything more than a standard model. Of course, there are subtleties and you would need to reach electroweak scales. So maybe that's a problem. But other than that, yeah, I, I don't have a very good answer. <laughs> I'm sure that Roberto might give you some better answer, but that will be mine. <laughs> well, maybe, I mean, that's what you can say is, uh, how much energy do you, do you need to construct a Higgs boson? Well, you need the, the minimum is the mass of the Higgs boson. The reality and engineering, that's a different problem, right? I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. So I think 
it's pretty much the same answer. Okay. Thanks. But, but just a comment. If I understood correctly what you said, Maria, in this case of the electroweak uh, traversable war room, the thing is that you, you assume that's eternal, right? So, so there's not, it's not even clear if the process of creating it is, 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 uh, uh, is possible, right? Well, that's the small subtlety. Of course, in their paper, they discussed how one could imagine actually making such a wormhole by um, using an analogy between atoms and how if you put the two atoms together, they would develop some sort of a dipole. But in, in this case, this would correspond to two rising nerds from black holes just getting closer and closer together until eventually they would end up having a throat um, between them. Of course, I don't know how this would happen. I don't think anybody knows how to make such a wormhole. That's why then in the section of creating traversable wormholes, I was talking about instantons and cosmic strings and making them. Um, you can maybe use spring or pair production, but that would make it very difficult for the wormhole to actually be traversable because in that setting, you make them, but then they go away from each other very fast because they're accelerating away from each other. So there are various subtleties that one would have to take into account, but I'm pretty sure that it's possible to actually cook up some um, example in which this would be possible. Can I ask a question? Of course. Hi. By the way, hi, Roberto. And uh, yeah, so you said that um, this uh, chronology protection uh, conjecture uh, that involves quantum gravity, but then you said it's the stress tensor that diverges on this chronology horizon, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, now, that, that seems a statement which is just a quantum field theory statement, not a quantum gravity statement. So, can, uh, do I need some of quantum gravity? Is it, 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 is, it is the quantum field theory stress tensor that diverges. So, I, do, I know, so, do I need to know something about really quantum gravity for, right. for that? Yeah. So, the way I like to think about it and the way I call it quantum gravity is because every time we have some divergence of the stress tensor at Cauchy horizons, for example, you have the same thing happening in inner horizons of um, uh, apparently strong cosmic censorship violating spacetimes. So every time you have such a divergence, that would indicate a sort of a singularity, right? So it would basically make that Cauchy horizon a singular horizon. And so all that I meant here by quantum gravity is that you need some new theory in order to resolve singularities. It's just a label for something that we don't know how to resolve, right? So you would need some other physics other than that. And in that sense is what um, quantum gravity would indicate here. But of course, I, I mean, my stress tends are diverging, I cannot pass through anyway. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. thank you. More questions? So, uh, I don't know if I understood correctly. When you make a long traversable wormhole, it is not, it cannot be used as a shortcut, okay? Correct. Uh, is it the same as uh, the statement that it cannot be used as a time machine? Like? Uh, Very good. It's not the same thing. It was thought in the past that it will be the same thing because of course, if something is a shortcut in space, then obviously it can be a shortcut in time. But with longer wormholes, it's not so clear. But one can show, and this is a part of the work that I've been doing with Roberto, that even with a long wormhole, one just simply has to wait a little bit longer in order for this time shift to be uh, bigger than the amount of time that it takes you to go back. So it's just a matter of uh, waiting longer. Of course, this is a resolution if you don't take this back reaction into effect. Because if you do take the back reaction effect, uh, which is what we can do with these parametrically controllable solutions, then you will see that the length actually adjusts itself as you try to make the time shift bigger. So as the time shift gets bigger, as the time goes slower, so to say, the length of the wormhole also gets bigger so that you can actually never go back and effectively making it always um, unapproachable to close the loop. <laughs> Was that clear? Okay. 
So uh, this protection for the formation of the time-like curves. Uh, I mean, you said that they, you didn't need quantum gravity, but you still need to be violating the nonlinear condition even to start with, right? That's true. In the back of your mind, you do have uh, a quantum supported black hole. Uh, sorry, well, you quantum, do need, a quantum right, supported. You always need, no. yes. So in order to have traversable wormholes, you always need quantum effects. They don't have to come from quantum gravity itself. They, as we've shown before, they can just come from the fields that you have in your space time. So it's basically GR plus, it's QFT encoded space time um, physics that you're using. And those quantum effects are going to be enough to make your wormhole um, supported with negative energy, right? But the quantum gravity part just comes in when you wanna actually make a time machine starting from a space time that's already allowing from su for such time machines, which uh, I guess we believe they don't exist. Mm -hmm. This is why we had two complementary views, starting from reasonable space time or starting with already pathological one and seeing what are the consequences. And can one, can one uh, just make, let's say, a non-traversable wormhole first uh, by entanglement, just assuming EPR equal ER, mm -hmm. then make it longer, and then make it into, into a time machine? I mean, what is this a strategy working or? Mm, so in ATS CFT, I mean, to build, the throat, a... to build the throat, can you start building a, a throat just uh, like um, in the standard non-traversable ones to begin with, and then make it traversable afterwards? Right, yes. So this is, for example, what Gar Jefferson and Wall did, right? So they already had the wormhole topology in the sense of the air bridge that was marginally traversable in the sense that the null energy along the horizon was zero. And so all that you needed okay, to do so is turn on a little bit of a negative energy to make it. Traversable. So I just need to make a, a factory outside to connect the, the two mouths the two mouths uh, directly somehow or faster than through the interior, right? Uh, right, but you have to be careful about what is faster because if you make um, the wormhole short, for example, that would violate something like the boundary causality or the generalized second law. So these energy conditions that I was mentioning before are connected exactly to these very physical points, like causality, for example. Mm -hmm. So it all works out. <laughs> One has to go through the details, but it, these are self-consistent solutions, so to say. An interesting question, for example, is something that I've been wondering right now is what goes wrong in the dual picture if I try to make a short wormhole? It's a fairly simple question, but I don't think we know enough details about both of these uh, sides of the dictionary to say something specific right now. But obviously something has to go wrong in the quantum teleportation picture, for example, if I try to make this wormhole shorter and shorter. Um, but yeah, that's that's one question one can ask. Okay, are there more questions? All right, so if there are no more questions, I would like to thank Maria again for this very nice and uh, entertaining discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I'm